My name is Marianne Williams and I'm a specialist gastroenterology community dietitian from Somerset Partnership NHS Foundation Trust. Welcome to this webinar on inflammatory bowel disease that's in remission. The webinar will run for roughly an hour. How we set about organising this webinar? Well, in order to prepare for this webinar, we surveyed a large group of IBD patients and asked them to send us their most pressing questions in relation to nutrition and their condition. We aim to cover most of these questions today and hope that in answering these questions, we will be able to improve your knowledge and help you gain more confidence in managing your IBD when in remission. Just a little note though, please bear in mind that this webinar is organized, set up and run solely by our dietetic team, including myself, Leah Seamark and Leslie Harper. And we're not IT experts, we're healthcare professionals. So there are bound to be IT glitches along the way and imperfections, so please bear with us. After the webinar, please ensure that you complete the quick survey. This will allow you to obtain the, the links to future webinars. So a little about this webinar. So this webinar is specifically looking at nutrition in relation to inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and it's with a team of NHS specialists. We'll not be discussing medication, surgery or any other aspects relevant to inflammatory bowel disease. Please seek advice from your specialist IBD team if you have additional questions so that they can give you the advice that is specifically relevant to you. So without further ado, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's panellists. We have Aileen Fraser, who's Inflammatory Bowel Disease Clinical Nurse Specialist at the Royal Bristol Royal Infirmary, uh, joined by Sam Poor. Sam is a Senior Specialist Dietitian in Gastroenterology and Lower Gastrointestinal Surgery at Bristol Royal Infirmary. We have Dr. Charlie Andrews. Uh, Charlie is a GP and is current IBD champion for Crohn's and Colitis UK and the Royal College of General Practitioners. And we have Dr. Emma Gregg, who's a consultant gastroenterologist at Taunton and Somerset NHS Foundation Trust. So moving on to just a few little housekeeping slides, just to make sure that everybody knows exactly what's going on. The handouts we've got today uh, attached to the webinar are Crohn's and Colitis UK booklet, Food and IBD, which is very useful. We've got a sheet on healthy eating on a vegetarian diet, diet and an Eat Well guidebook from 2018 as well. So what is the aim of this webinar? The aim of this webinar is to give you the most up-to-date information on diet and IBD, which we hope will increase your knowledge and confidence in managing your condition in uh, remission. What we will cover tonight is we will introduce IBD and the different conditions, how they affect the gut and respond to diet. We'll go through all the issues around diet and IBD based on what the IBD sufferers most wanted to know and answer questions about specific areas of diet and give our top tips for managing the diet and IBD. Just a little final point uh, on this housekeeping section about the word of the, uh, the use of the word remission. We will use the term remission throughout the webinar. By this, we mean the absence of active disease or when you are not in a flare for your IBD. OK, passing over to um, Aileen now with a background on IBD. Thank you for that, Marianne. Um, I first of all just want to talk to you about what normal gut function is. So the real work of the digestive system work, it takes place in the small intestine. And that's just beyond the stomach. Uh, in the small intestine, the digestive juices mix with the food. Um, and in that way, they, they break down the food into smaller molecules. And these are then absorbed in the surface of the small bowel. Um, and then that is distributed from there um, to the rest of the body by the bloodstream. The watery food residue and the secretions are not digested in the small bowel, they part into the large bowel, into the colon. At that point, the colon then reabsorbs um, the water which is added, uh, was added to the food um, in the small intestine. And that way it's all really recycled. From there, you actually then get your solid stool being passed out from, from the other end. Um, so in the abnormal function in the small bowel, what happens is it becomes inflamed. Um, and when it's inflamed, it's unable to then actually digest and absorb the nutrients. Also, it can be scarred, and when it's scarred, it can get tightenings, and actually it's then painful for food to pass through, especially if it's fibrous. Furthermore, if you've got incompletely digested foods that go into the colon, that affects reabsorption, and so you get more diarrhea. So clearly, the, the small bowel is very important um, with nutrition. Uh, in the large bowel, um, basically in ulcerative colitis, the large bowel becomes inflamed. Um, the, the small bowel is actually still working normally, so it means you should be getting your nutrition from your food, but you can get severe diarrhoea. 
In normal gut function, we usually absorb about 1500 mils of fluid um, as it travels from the ileum to the rectum. So that's quite a lot of fluid that if it's not being reabsorbed to come out the other end. So if you are actually passing all this out, you could um, be at risk of dehydration. So if we move on to the, um, uh, the question here, we've got a poll question, uh, which we've done in sort of who wants to be millionaire fashion. And the question is, will ulcerative colitis stop me from absorbing uh, nutrients from my food? So A would be yes, B would be no, C would be don't know, and D would be only some of the time. So what do people feel, if you're watching this webinar, what do you feel would be the answer? The answer is B, no. So will ulcerative colitis stop me from absorbing my nutrients from my food? No. And we'll go on to explain that a little bit more detail now. If I pass back to Aileen. So um, in Crohn's disease, how does that affect gut function? Well, the inflammation can affect the, absorption, uh, the absorption of nutrients because of the inflammation in the small bowel. It's the small bowel where all that work is done. Also, if you get scarring, so fibrosis, um, it, especially in the small bowel, that you can get that in the colon as well. That can cause pain and lead to changes in the consistency of the, the, the food that you can actually eat because if you're eating something that's very fibrous, it won't go through or it, it will cause pain. And that is due to the obstruction, which again can be caused either by the inflammation um, or the scarring. So clearly malabsorption of nutrients is a big problem in Crohn's disease. Um, with ulcerative colitis, it's not quite the same. The inflammation causes diarrhea and then this risk of dehydration as the fluid's not reabsorbed. Also, you can have an altered transit time. And what that means is that everything just goes through an awful lot more quickly. Um, and you get urgency and sometimes incontinence, which is really very um, uncomfortable. Also, you can sometimes get abdominal pain with this. The, alter absor the altered absorption of the foods and the salts uh, is, is the real problem, but you don't actually have a malabsorption of anything. Okay, and Emma and Charlie, Emma, you're a gastroenterologist, and Charlie, you're a GP. So do either of you have anything to add to your, uh, in your experience, uh, in your professions to add to that? I would completely agree with what Aileen said there. That's really clear. Some parts of the small bowel will absorb different things. And I think we'll go on to cover that later on in the webinar. Um, for example, the small bowel is made up of three parts. But, and we know that the middle of the small bowel is the most important in terms of absorbing the nutrients, whereas, say, certain parts, say, lower down at the bottom end of the ileum may be important for things like specific nutrients such as B12. And so it depends where, whereabouts in your small bowel depends on what particular things you might struggle with if you have Crohn's disease. That clearly doesn't affect you if you have ulcerative colitis. OK, and I think that's a really interesting point, that the Crohn's disease, you can have malabsorption of some nutrients, and yet in ulcerative colitis, you don't. Do you have anything to add to that, Charlie? Um, no, I'd, I'd echo the same, the same really. I yeah. mean, as a, as a general practitioner, um, you know, it's important for us to know where things are being absorbed so that we can assess and check for those things mm. when we're doing blood tests. So, for example, if we're looking for B12 deficiency, mm. um, we're looking at people with Crohn's who may have active disease in the terminal ileum, but we, we use similar sort of processes to work out what, what we should be looking for and how to help with the nutritional status. Okay, that's great. So moving on to the, the next slide, Aileen. So um, here we're just really looking at what is active disease. So active disease, it generally means you've got an increase in symptoms. This is usually caused by um, inflammation and maybe associated scarring. Um, again, that's really only for Crohn's disease, but inflammation in, in both. Um, we, this is evidence to us, um, healthcare professionals by scans and blood tests um, and just talking to you about your increased symptoms and sometimes doing stool tests and things like that. Um, and it's likely to lead to having increased contact with people like myself and my colleagues around the table um, and needing additional information and increase these increased investigations. Okay. And what about remission? Well, remission really is just the ability to take part in normal everyday activities, to be able to do those things that you want to do, to be able to get out, to have the confidence to go to work, to, to plan social events, plan holidays, all that kind of stuff. So just actually being normal. Okay, so not having any symptoms at all, is that what we mean? When well, I think it can be, but it can also depend on what your disease is and whether you've had surgery or not and, you know, what kinds of medications you're on, but it's about having the confidence to go out and, and, and get on with your life. Okay, that's fantastic. So we want to move on now to really focusing on what came back with the, uh, the questions from uh, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, the things that they really wanted to know about uh, in particular. And um, Aileen and Sam have done a very good job of putting these in order of what you really wanted to know about most. So if I pass uh, back over to um, Aileen for the should uh, should I take nutritional supplements or my IBDs? Oh, I think Sam was going to answer. Okay, so, brilliant. Okay, thank you, Marion. 
So yes, one of the key things that comes up is about nutritional supplements and in remission, a normal varied healthy diet should be able to meet most of your needs, uh, your, your micronutrient needs for vitamins and minerals, um, particularly if you've got ulcerative colitis where the colon is not a site for nutritional absorption as, as we've already mentioned. However, there's various things that could have an effect on that. So previous micronutrient deficiencies are the effects of different medication and surgery and whereabouts in the bowel, the site of disease is active or has been active and any restriction in the diet due to symptoms or poor appetite can lead to an inadequate intake of uh, or supply of micronutrients. We don't have a huge amount of guidelines to follow with this. Uh, as Charlie and Emma have already mentioned, blood tests will highlight some deficiencies but can't to highlight all of our micronutrient deficiencies. And sometimes just a good assessment of the diet can help show up whether some things might be deficient or not. So that is where a good dietary analysis can come, come into okay. effect. And research shows that often people are low in things like vitamin A, C, D, E, calcium, folate, and iron at diagnosis. Is that is that a very common finding? Does ever do you as a GP find that people are quite low in nutrients when you when they're diagnosed? Uh, they can be. There are certain nutrients mm. that they're more at risk of. Okay. Um, w you know, as general practitioners, we can't we can't assess for all nutrients. We don't have blood tests to look for all of them. But there are certain ones that we know people are at higher risk of. For example, iron in ulcerative colitis, yeah. um, B12, folate in, in Crohn's disease. Okay, that's excellent. So, what about you, Emma? Do you find particular nutrients are an issue for you with these patients? I think I would agree with that. I think mm. iron patients are often low, whether they're diagnosed with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Mm. Folic acid, B12. Mm. tends to be Crohn's disease again. Calcium, again, more often Crohn's disease, but um, vitamin D is a difficult one because as a population, we live in a fairly cold, dark country, and particularly if you measure most of the population in winter, it's going to be low, whether they have active disease or not. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, because one of the questions that came in from a patient was, is there a best time of year to be tested for vitamin D? Does it make any difference whether you're tested with vitamin D in the summer or in the winter? The whole population pretty much is low between about December and about April before we start to pick up again as the summer comes. So your baseline, I guess, is in the middle of the summer. Mm -hmm. But and there is some evidence around what particular thing we should be measuring with vitamin D. So I don't think it's as simple as the blood test tells us the whole answer. So I think general population advice about getting out and getting some sunshine yeah. with appropriate sunscreen advice if needed. But 20 minutes out in the sun, then put sunscreen on we would tend okay. to recommend because most of our vitamin D, as I think Sam will probably come on to cover, comes from the sunlight effect on vitamin A. Yeah. OK, so should they be taking supplements anyway? Should diabetes patients be taking supplements for vitamin D? Handing that over to Sam. Well, certainly if they come back with a low vitamin D level on, on blood tests, then, yeah, the only way to really try and get that up would be through supplementation. But good, good advice on sunlight exposure during the summer months is also essential. Mm. You can get a little bit from diet, but there wouldn't be enough to really increase your, your levels significantly. Okay. Um, and I don't know if Aileen wants to make a point about the mm. effect of some medication with, with vitamin D. Uh, I guess with vitamin D, it's not necessarily the, the, the medication, but we do know that it can actually increase inflammation if you've got very low vitamin D. So I think having a, a vitamin D level um, that, that's good is, is helpful. And it is very difficult to get that in this country with the combination of the, the lack of sunlight and the um, we're also, also we're always advising people to use sunscreen. Excellent. Yes, because of course sunscreen stops you absorbing that sunlight, doesn't it? Yeah. So you're in that sort of yeah. catch-22 situation, aren't you? Um, one one of the patients said, uh, what does vitamin D do? It's, it's certainly important for helping the absorption of calcium um, mm -hmm. from, from the diet and in the bowel. So yes, it's essential in that role. So you need it to be able to absorb your calcium. So it would be all very well taking calcium mm -hmm. supplements, but if you didn't have vitamin D, you wouldn't be able to absorb the calcium effectively. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, you certainly need sufficient vitamin D to okay. help that absorption. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Yeah, so I was going to talk a little bit about enteral nutrition, which again is something that crops up as a question. Enteral nutrition is normally a form of nutrition uh, reserved for periods of flare-up, um, particularly of Crohn's disease, where it can actually form part of the treatment uh, to help mucosal healing. Um, enteral normally refers to what goes through the gut and it's often used as a term for tube feeding, as you can see with the lady with the feeding tube passing up her nostril down into her stomach. But enteral meaning through the gut can also refer to uh, drinks, special drinks that can be taken by mouth. And as you can see, there's various examples of those sorts of drinks in the other picture. And they are usually nutritionally complete for all the vitamins and minerals you need. 
and have a high calorie content and protein content, but can also be specially designed to be easily absorbed in the gut and uh, what we call elemental feeds. So in periods of flare up, you may need to use those supplements, but in remission, it's unlikely you would need to unless you have lost a considerable amount of weight and are unable to meet your calorie and protein needs through your normal diet. And then you may be advised to take those to help meet your calorie and protein needs that way. Okay, so um, the other interesting question we get about is uh, probiotics. Yes, so probiotics, they're another type of supplement um, and they contain the beneficial bacteria that are normally present in our gut. And uh, the aim is to replace those bacteria if we've lost uh, them through disease or through medication that might have had an effect on gut bacteria. And we know that IBD and many other conditions are affected by an alteration to our natural populations of bacteria in our bodies. And it's currently an area of uh, huge research interest um, there's uh, always been an assumption that, that um, if we take the probiotic bacteria as supplements, it can't actually be harmful, but even that's recently been called into question. So it's very important to consider whether it's worth taking these supplements. Uh, even, what would be your advice? What would be your advice on taking probiotics at the moment? I think given that there isn't any sound um, reason to, to act, that they're actually going to help your, your uh, bacteria levels in your bowel, I'd say probably not use them at the moment, but we do need more research and there is more research being done all the time. And hopefully we will have some better guidance that okay. we can offer people. Uh, and there are a lot of different bacteria, aren't there? I think that's half the problem that, you know, the ones that get manufactured are not necessarily the ones that everybody needs, but we don't manufacture a, a wide selection yet. Do we? There's certainly that. And there's also the, the way they get delivered to the bowel as well and whether okay. that really delivers them. And even once they get there, whether they are actually going to do the job that we're expecting them to do. Okay, um, brilliant. Um, can any foods trigger IBD? So the answer to this really is no. Uh, people often assume that food has caused a trigger of their, their IBD, but this is most likely to be a coincidence because they've eaten something that may have caused what we call a, a functional gut symptom. So where uh, some, some intolerance to food that they've eaten such as in the picture, bread or wheat or lactose and dairy food may have triggered that uh, feeling of, of discomfort or pain. So but should it's we use a... exclusion diets, do you think? Or... Um, exclusion diets can be used for all sorts of different reasons. And there, there are various exclusion diets that uh, are available. Uh, there, there's all sorts of different ones for different purposes. Some have the intention to actually help manage the symptoms and some are really just to help uh, alleviate some of the pain and discomfort. Um, so it depends what the exclusion diet's really being aimed to do. Things like they the low can... flex diet that you hear about would, um, I'm sure uh, say that several patients would have heard of that. Is that useful? Is that something you use? The low flex diet's a diet that's mainly used to help somebody reintroduce a normal diet after they've been in a flare up of Crohn's disease. And it's specifically used for Crohn's disease rather than ulcerative colitis. It's, uh, it, it stands for a low fat fiber limited exclusion diet, and it helps people to go from what could have been a, a strict liquid diet that might have helped them to bring them into remission from a flare and then return to normal eating gradually uh, and prolong their period of remission. And it has been used very effectively in some people. The trouble with exclusion diets is, is as I say, they exclude large groups of food often and can be very difficult to follow in the long term. And if you don't notice an immediate benefit from them, a lot of people then stop using them. So it needs to be done with careful support mm -hmm. with the support of a specialist dietitian who can guide you through what foods to cut out, how to carefully reintroduce them, and make sure that you don't exclude many foods for long periods of time. That's really useful to know, actually. And I know a lot of people talk about lactose and dairy, don't they? And the, uh, the differences between a lactose, a low lactose diet and a dairy free diet. And I think it's quite important to make that distinction, isn't it? That, you know, we're talking with a low lactose mm -hmm. diet, we're not talking about taking out all forms of dairy. In a low lactose diet, you would just limit your milk and your yogurt and your ice cream, but you would still eat normal cheese, you'd still have chocolate, you'd still have other forms of dairy like spread, etc., cream, sour cream, creme fraiche. You just would really concentrate on the yogurt, the milk and the ice cream. So it's definitely not a dairy-free diet. Um, a dairy-free diet is completely different where you would be having absolutely no dairy from any animal at all. 
Um, and the question is whether these diets are actually any use for uh, inflammatory bowel disease patients. I mean, what, what's your feeling on that, Sam? Well, certainly uh, quite a large uh, number of people report lactose intolerance anyway, and it's, it's actually um, not uncommon for people to struggle with large amounts of lactose in the diet due to variable amounts of the lactase enzyme in the small bowel. And the lactase enzyme in the small bowel can be reduced because of various disease states and gastroenteritis and, and inflammatory bowel disease. So people with inflammatory bowel disease may well be lactose intolerant. It is an intolerance, which means you should be able to tolerate a small amount of it. And you need to work out roughly how much that is so that you can use it in small amounts without causing any problems, but without having to restrict your diet too much. OK, you could use the low lactose. You get the lacto-free milk and lacto-free yogurt yeah. in the supermarket. Absolutely. Right? There's lots of lactose-free products mm. available. There's lots of other milk-free uh, products to make sure that you can still get enough calcium in your diet. And as you say, hard cheeses are low in lactose anyway, mm. so they can mm. form a, a good source of calcium without mm. the lactose. Okay. Dairy-free is a, a completely different kettle of fish, and most people who need to be on a dairy-free diet, it's because of a dairy allergy, and that's quite unusual in adulthood. It's quite, quite rare, and it, it's unlikely to be a problem, and so it can be quite problematic to completely cut out dairy because you are going to remove a lot of sources of lactate, uh, of calcium in your diet. A lot of people ask with um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease whether they have a food allergy. How relevant do you think food allergy is generally? I mean, you touched on the fact that dairy allergy is very rare, but how do you think food allergy is something people should be considering? Not specifically, no. I think that's, that's unrelated really to inflammatory bowel disease and uh, allergies can produce all sorts of, of reactions in the body, which are quite sometimes quite intense. And I think you would be aware whether you're having that allergic reaction or whether it was more your inflammatory bowel disease that was causing a problem. OK, so we get a lot of, I mean, in my clinic, we get a lot of um, patients who want to get allergy testing done. And I think the really important thing to understand with allergy testing is that you can have two types. You can have a blood specific IgE blood test or IgE skin prick testing. Now these tests are only useful for people who have allergy that is very immediate, so they get immediate responses. So for instance, somebody with peanut allergy who within seconds of touching peanut in their mouth will have uh, anaphylactic type responses or very serious skin rashes or breathing compromise. Uh, and that's not what we're talking about with inflammatory bowel disease, is it? So these allergy tests would be no use at all in an inflammatory bowel disease situation unless that patient happened to also have food allergies. I think the important thing is that if people are going to try different dietary inputs and try because they're concerned that there is something going on, they must only take out a food for a maximum of two to three weeks and if your symptoms are not better, you must put it back in again. And this is what we quite often see is that people have taken foods out hoping it will make them better it hasn't made them any better and they've kept the food out and so their diet gets more and more restricted which obviously makes them nutritionally compromised so the one thing i would say i don't know what you feel about this sam is that if you do suspect a food although we know it's very rare if you do suspect it take out that food group only under the guidance of a dietitian and do it for a maximum of two to three weeks and if it hasn't helped put the food back in does that sound about right yes absolutely certainly because otherwise you can end up progressively restricting your diet more and more to the point where you're eating only a very small range of foods and your diet becomes very nutritionally inadequate okay great and moving on should you alter your fiber intake well, this is something that depends very much on the individual and it's one of the areas that is very specific to individual people. Um, Fibre is a very important part of the diet. It's uh, responsible for a, a healthy bowel movement, a healthy bowel function. Fibre contributes to the natural populations of bacteria in our bowel, so it's important for that point of view. But whether you need to alter your fibre intake depends on various factors, such as the previous disease or activity of disease you might have had, and whether that's changed the anatomy of your bowel at all, surgery that you might have had, and whether the surgical changes to your bowel mean that you now should cut down on fibre. And certainly if you've had large amounts of your small bowel removed or you've got an ileostomy, then having too much fibre in your diet can cause you to lose too much fluid through your stoma. So that's something that would need to be looked at, uh, particularly if you are finding that you're becoming dehydrated from that point of view. So how can you maintain a healthy body if you can't eat much fruit and veg? 
Well, hopefully you'll be able to eat some fruit and veg, and, and that's one of the key things really, is that if you need to cut down on your fibre, hopefully it's just cutting down and that you can still include a reasonable range, but you might just need to be careful on the types that you're including and the, the particular ways they're served or prepared so that the fibre content is not too high. There's different types of fibre as well. There's uh, fibres that contribute to stool bulk and there's fibres that form more of a gel in the bowel that can help to improve bowel function. And the, the ones that form more of a gel tend to absorb fluid in the bowel, so they can be quite useful to help reduce uh, diarrhoea. What sort of foods are you talking about there with those? So things like oats and some of the, the, the pulses can be effective from that point of view um, okay. and sk certain skins. But then some people do find that skins, nuts, seeds are more problematic and irritate them mm. more. So really it needs uh, a discussion with your dietitian to work out which foods are causing the problem, whether it is even the fibre itself or whether other foods are irritating. And we're going to come on and, and touch on, on uh, the format diet later. So That's right. that might so, sort of cover mm, a bit more on that as well. There might be other parts of the carbohydrate. In, in the so problem. one of the frequently asked questions, should I alter my fat intake? Well, as you can see in the picture, there's different types of fat in the diet and um, the, the picture shows there's the plant sources of fats that come from various plants, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and also from the oily fish. And these are what we call the unsaturated fats and have more of a positive effect on our, our diet and health. And then there's the what we call the saturated fats, which tend to be more problematic, specifically if a heart disease and can uh, have a negative effect on our health overall. So too much fat in the diet overall is not good for us. And we need to be careful that we're not having too much fat. OK, so can I should I be a vegan? Because obviously veganism is very uh, popular at the moment. What's your feeling about being a vegan with IBD? Well, if you choose to be a vegan and if you are a vegan and following a vegan lifestyle or if after diagnosis you chose to choose to be a vegan, then certainly you can be supported to make sure that you have a healthy diet um, as, as a vegan. But there's no benefit to becoming a vegan if you uh, think that it might help your IBD. So there, there is some evidence that high intakes of red meat can increase the um, severity of your IBD. But it's really a case of looking at how much you're eating now and restricting it down to a healthy level and making sure you're not having too much processed food in the diet. Too much processed food is definitely linked with an increased risk of IBD and flare up. So making sure that there isn't too much processed meats, particularly in the diet, can be helpful. But you don't need to go as far as having a complete vegan diet to help control your IBD. OK, a, so a vegan diet can mm. also contain a large amount of fibre, which, okay. again, may yeah. be problematic. So that might being, actually trigger some functional symptoms, some functional symptoms. Mm. It won't actually trigger a flare up of your ID, but it might mm. make it more difficult to manage your symptoms. OK, that's that's true. I wanted to put out a question to the sort of group in general and um, particularly Charlie, who I know you don't mind if I mention the fact that you have an inflammatory bowel disease background yourself with osteocolitis. Um, fibre, does fibre trigger inflammatory bowel disease? Did you find fibre was a, an aggravator for you? So I think if I if I take off my GP hat and yes. put on my IBD patient hat, yes. um, I, I recall that, um, that stress was a major trigger for me. Mm -hmm. In terms of foods, I tried to exclude just about everything at some point mm -hmm. to try to find something that was triggering it, but I found it very difficult to find. I did find that when my bowel was, was disturbed, I found that, that low fibre was, was beneficial in some ways because it was almost like resting the bowel slightly. So mm -hmm. I did find that that was helpful and that high fibre foods were a bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in terms of triggers, for me, certainly stress was a major one and, uh, and um, there are a number of other ones. And I think Emma's going to Yeah, Emma, what's, what's your feeling? I mean, are there things that you think do trigger IBD? Yes, no doubt there are. Um, antibiotics can quite often upset your gut bacteria. Quite often people say that a course of antibiotics, particularly if they already have IBD, will set them off. Um, something like an infection, Campylobacter, can often unmask inflammatory bowel disease that's never been present before. So patients have ongoing symptoms despite having effective treatment for their Campylobacter. So infections like that, again, probably are upsetting the gut bacteria and, and then just promoting the, or something like, such as ulcerative colitis starting. And in terms of drugs, non-steroidal drugs, such as ibuprofen, Voltarol, um, and there are a number of other ones in that family, they're notorious for setting people off. Mm. So people are often prescribed those because arthritis can be related to both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. But those sorts of drugs should really be avoided because they can often make the underlying bowel disease worse. 
Okay, and Ailey, what's your feeling on that with the the triggers? That you I think yeah, I, I, it's all going on from what Emma said about certain medications. We know there's certain medications uh, other than the non steroids that can be problematic. So some forms of metformin. Um, can be problematic some forms of the statins can be problematic so if you start a new drug and you get diarrhea please do contact your IBD team or contact your GP because very often I think Charlie especially with the statins and stuff there's other alternatives we can use isn't there there are okay that's good so basically on a medication front if you're concerned like for instance you've got arthritis and you have been taking some of these drugs really it's important to go and see your GP or your IBD specialist team and get more information from them Especially if you're running into problems. Yeah. Okay, yes. that's great. And it's important that your GP is aware of, of your underlying inflammatory bowel disease as well, so that they can prescribe appropriately. So make sure that they're very aware that you've got inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. And just be careful as a patient if you're buying things over the counter in the chemist. Yes. So again, pharmacists do offer the chance to talk to somebody. Um, mm. And again, you know, the fact that you have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease and you've chosen to go to the pharmacy rather than your GP, make sure that they're aware of that before you buy those sorts of drugs. Okay, that's brilliant. Moving on to, is alcohol safe? Um, what's your feeling, Aileen? Um, I think that alcohol, if you have to, especially if you have too much of it, can cause diarrhea and that can exacerbate the symptoms. So you have to be very careful. Um, alcohol is generally not contraindicated. There's only one medication that we use where we would say it's, uh, you know, you, sh you probably shouldn't have it with methotrexate. However, uh, I think if you look on some of the websites, they will actually say as long as you stay within the 14 <laughs> units week that the guidance from um, the government and um, then that should probably be okay but you really don't want to be um, overindulging. Does okay. it bring on a flare-up? Can alcohol actually trigger a flare-up? What's your feeling Emma? I have seen it happen mm -hmm. but again you know often it's associated a big flare-up is yeah. associated with going abroad on holiday which is a change yeah, of water, a change of food so yeah. quite often it's a whole combination of things so it's hard mm -hmm. to say it's just the alcohol. Okay that's fair. So moving on to the next one, um, Sam is junk food safe? Well, junk food does tend to have a very negative association with foods that have a low nutritional value and are unhealthy. Um, these foods also tend to be low in fibre and some micronutrients, but they're also quite high in calories and protein and usually salt and sugar too. Uh, they may have a role to play in short term periods when the appetite's poor and it can be an easy way to, to get your energy intake up and prevent weight loss. But in the long term, they may cause problems with the amount of fat that's in them, the processed nature of them, the amount of additives and other um, processed components to them. So generally, they, they will be safe in the short term, but in the, as a long term option, it's best to avoid them. And you're saying that earlier that actually research shows that sometimes that could be linked to IBD um, flowers, the amount of, of processed food you eat, is that correct? Yeah, there, there is evidence that a diet that's high in processed foods can mm. increase the uh, incidence and severity of IBD. Okay. okay, so moving on to the next slide, um, one of the frequently asked questions is, should I take herbal supplements uh, like turmeric or fermented foods? What's your feeling about that, Sam? Well, people often ask about whether there are herbal supplements that might be helpful, and turmeric's one that's quite popular. There is evidence that turmeric can reduce inflammation and reduce relapse in IBD, but so far research is quite limited. And there's no consensus or guidance on what dose to take or what frequency or for how long. And turmeric supplements can be quite costly. So it's very difficult to really give, give any proper advice on this. You can also add turmeric to your meals for flavor, but the amount you'd need to add would probably unlikely have any therapeutic effect. And if you did try and achieve a therapeutic effect, you'd probably make your meals quite unpalatable. So for the time being, I would recommend that you can carry on using turmeric in your recipes as you need to, but can't really advise on supplements at the moment. And that could be quite expensive without any real guarantee of benefit. OK, and the fermented foods, which obviously is very popular at the moment, uh, but fermented foods such as fermented cabbage, uh, kefir, pickled vegetables, etc., are actually pickled onions, for instance, are all actually very high in fermenting ability. So in the gut, they may cause problems, nothing to do with your IBD. Is that, is they that may do, yeah. I mean, the, the, the quite popular ones are things like kefir, which is a mm. fermented milk product, which may increase the amount of lactose in your diet. And if that is problematic for you, then you probably need to avoid that. And as you say, yes, fermented cabbages and other, other fermented foods can give you more functional gut symptoms where you might experience bloating or abdominal pain. So it's difficult to advise on them, but um, if, if you get on well with them, then by all means include them in small amounts. Okay. And should I use omega-3 when in remission? Well, that's a, a very good question as well and something that's, that's of huge interest. Um, 
we do know that omega-3 fatty acids do have an anti-inflammatory effect and they are used in some conditions for their anti-inflammatory effect but there's not a huge amount of evidence that they have that role in IBD. So they, they're available in oil, things like oily fish and they're added to certain foods like margarines and mayonnaise and you can take them as a supplement. And by all means, use and enjoy oily fish and, and the foods that they contain, but there's probably not a huge amount of role for them to play in actually reducing the inflammation in IBD. So is there such a thing as an anti-inflammatory diet? Because you hear that banded around on the internet, don't you, an anti-inflammatory diet yeah. on social media? Again, this comes back to processed foods again, really, and it's often the, the, the additives used in foods and high sugar diets and high fat diets that are most likely to have a pro-inflammatory effect if there is such a thing. So as long as you're trying to choose a, a balanced, healthy, varied diet and your diet's not too high in processed foods and that you're, you're keeping your diet as healthy as possible, then you're unlikely to have any problems with the inflammatory effect of your diet. And there isn't really an anti-inflammatory diet as such that, that you can be advised to follow. Okay, that's really useful. What about the low FODMAP diet? I've had a lot of IBD patients asking whether they should use this. And of course, there is some research now coming out saying that it can be useful in Crohn's and osteocolitis. So what's your feeling about that? Well, again, this is a diet that reduces certain carbohydrates in the diet, which are known to increase intestinal gas and increase the amount of fluid in the bowel. And so by removing those from the diet, you can remove some of the what we call functional symptoms, where you get discomfort, bloating, urgency to open your bowels by having too many of these foods in the diet. And it's a common diet used for irritable bowel syndrome. People who've had changes to their bowel caused by their IBD might find that they do have some underlying symptoms related to those changes. And so they might benefit from trying a low FODMAPs diet. But I'd recommend if you do want to try this to have a look at what foods you need to cut out and certainly what foods you need to replace those with and only cut out foods for the recommended period of time which is about six to eight weeks and make sure you always do this with the help of an uh, experienced dietitian who's got experience in uh, managing a low FODMAPs diet for you. So are we saying that actually with some inflammatory bowel disease patients they also have functional symptoms on top of it so they uh, and I get the impression that sometimes that worries them they get the functional symptoms they think it's their IBD flaring but actually it's the functional IBS type symptoms behind it. Is that's, that correct? that's right yeah so in remission you can still get ongoing symptoms so functional symptoms. that's right functional mm. symptoms it's not actually inflammation or your IBD mm. flaring up but it can still make you feel quite unwell and, and interfere with getting on with normal life and so making slight adjustments to your diet and trying a low FODMAPs diet and then reintroducing those foods again to a level you can tolerate can be helpful but you do need to do this with the support of a dietitian who's got experience in this. Um, one of the things we've got here as a team is we've done a low FODMAP diet webinar and I, I get a lot of patients who end up going on the internet and looking up Dr Google and advice about the FODMAP diet because it's quite complicated isn't it and yeah. there aren't always dietitians available in every area of the UK who can give um, advice to individual patients on the low FODMAP diet. So we have got a, a webinar together done by specialists here in this team um, on the low FODMAP diet and patients simply need to email. The email address is patient.webinars at nhs.net and that's at the bottom of the slide you can see there. So patient.webinars at nhs.net is at the bottom of the slide. So I think it's gone in green there. It's on blue on my uh, side. So if you email that address, you will get a registration link and ask for the low FODMAP diet, you'll get the registration link. Yeah, moving on to another frequently asked question. Can I replace medication with diet? Aileen, what's your feeling on that? Not really, no. No, <laughs> simple answer. Yeah. Okay. And how individual is diet advice generally? Is it a very individual thing or does the same advice given to all IBD patients? What's your feeling, Emma? Is Quite it... often, if, if patients haven't got active inflammation, then these are functional symptoms. What I tend to advise people to do is the easy things, such as cutting down or out on things like bread, pasta, processed foods. That will quite often help people, particularly if they're then um, able to do things, temporarily reduce alcohol. You know, they'll often, they'll often come to you with what their triggers are and they just need to think about it. But yes, it's something I manage quite a lot with my patients and you can often make them feel quite a lot better with making some really minimal changes. Would you agree? Absolutely. And I think people, most people know what those changes are. It's just they quite often just need to come in and discuss it. Okay. And in your experience, Charlie, would you say the same as a GP? 
Yeah, no, I say the same thing. Mm. Yeah. So it's very, so it is quite individual to each patient yeah. as to what yeah. they specifically are going to find useful. Is that right? It is, it is yeah. very difficult to give broad advice that covers everybody, certainly. Mm. And yeah, there's no one diet that fits all. Okay, brilliant. So another little question of our how wants to be a millionaire type of question, which foods should I eat to cure my inflammatory bowel disease? So based on what you've heard so far, which food should I eat to cure my inflammatory bowel disease? A, a high protein foods, B, omega-3 fats, C, a vegan diet, or D, no foods are a cure. And uh, hopefully when you've been listening to this, it'll make sense that no foods uh, are a cure is the answer to that one. So moving on to the next question, Aileen, why do I feel so tired constantly was a question that the patient came up with. Well, I think first of all, we need to distinguish between tiredness and fatigue. They're used a lot um, simultaneously these days. And actually, the, very often you, when you're tired, you need to think, first of all, am I sleeping properly? So the tiredness is usually because you're not sleeping properly, not getting ad adequate sleep. Fatigue is something different. It's when you're actually getting adequate amount of sleep, you're still very fatigued, you're feeling very tired despite that. Um, and that actually may be due to a number of things, and it can be multifaceted. It can be more than one thing at the same time. So it can be due to the fact that you've got inflammatory bowel disease. It's a chronic illness. It affects you lifelong. You're not getting those quality sleep. You know, you need you maybe have a very hectic lifestyle. You need to actually have some downtime. You need to be kind to yourself. Um, it might be due to your medication. If you become very fatigued after you started make, taking your medication, please go back and see your team. It may be that you may, need a change in that. It may be due to the fact you've got low iron or low B12. Sometimes it's due to the fact you've had a lot of weight loss or indeed you've been on a lot of steroids and you've had a lot of weight gain. Poor nutrition, there's lots of things that can be involved. But actually, first thing to ask yourself is, am I getting enough sleep? And I'm actually, am I being kind to myself? Am I having enough downtime? Yeah, that's a really great answer, actually. Um, and our healthy eating takeaway message, Sam, what's your, your feeling here? Well, as you can see on the screen, it's um, the, the image of the Eat Well plate was just one of the ways that we can depict how to follow a healthy diet. And as you can see, a large proportion of the diet should be made up of plant-based foods and vegetables, fruits, grains, so that, that your diet is not too high in fat, not too high in processed foods, and that you don't overload the diet with any one nutrient in particular and keep your diet as varied as possible. Okay, any comments on that? I would say cutting processed foods. And one of the concerns about the, um, the yellow portion would be that most of those are packets okay. and processed. So again, thinking about reducing that proportion, ideally, especially if your disease is in remission, potentially having fruit and vegetables, Mm. particularly a lot of different colours because that gives you a lot of different useful phytochemicals, micronutrients, um, that, that would really be the best way forward. Yeah, because this of course is a healthy eating plate for the general population, not yes. necessarily for IBD patients. Yes. Okay, that's fantastic. So moving on to uh, our last um, who wants to be a millionaire question, which food should I avoid during remission? A, fibre, B, dairy, C, meat or D, none? And of course the answer is none. What's your feeling, Charlie? Should every patient with IBD be referred to a dietitian? Uh, I don't think every patient needs to be re referred. I think if patients want to be referred for more information, then that's that's absolutely reasonable thing to do. Um, a lot of people feel that they don't need to and, and are quite happy. Um, but if, so, if someone feels that they want a bit more information, then yes, they, they could be referred. If they're not immediately obvious for a referral, when do you think there comes a time when really they should be getting a referral for a dietitian? Is it just when their symptoms are out of control that they should be seeing places, uh, people like Aileen at that point, presumably? I think if someone's got quite mm. difficult symptoms, I'd be asking the hospital to see them rather than be seeing them in general practice. So that would be yeah. a referral to the IBD team at the hospital. Um, that, that would be my my route as a okay. GP. And how do you get an appointment to see a dietitian? Would it be about just asking your GP to refer you to the local hospital or refer you to the specialist team in your area? So yeah, so the services and, and, and the referral pathways that we talk about would be different mm. in different areas, but essentially a GP could refer to your to your to your local hospital, to the dietitian team based there. Okay. And uh, and should be able to access that. And what's your experience with that, Emma? Is it just can you refer when you see patients? Do you refer them? Do you have a dietetic team working in the hospital? We do, yes. We have a specialist dietitian and they, the referral will come directly from us or from our IBD nurses. Okay, so most, uh, Ailey, would you say that most areas in the UK generally they have dietitians on their team in their IBD specialist team? I think I think most of them do, not all of them do, and some have more than others, So, um, but it should be available to you. 
Okay. But sometimes it takes a little while. Okay, so in summary, uh, what we've covered today, there are two conditions that fall under the banner of inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and osteophytitis. Crohn's disease can cause malabsorption of nutrients while osteophytitis does not. There is no specific diet for IBD and a balanced, varied, healthy diet is what people with IBD should be aiming for whilst in remission. Excluding food groups should only be done for two to three weeks and then the food must be reintroduced if symptoms are no better. If exclusion is helpful, seek dietetic guidance to ensure the diet is balanced. And don't forget that allergy testing is unlikely to be useful in inflammatory bowel disease. There are no foods that need to be eliminated from the diet when IBD is in remission. No foods or dietary interventions will cure your inflammatory bowel disease. You cannot replace medication with diet and nutritional supplements are not necessary unless your blood results suggest their use or you're advised by your medical team to take them. So what I want to finish with um, tonight is really one top tip from each of you. So if we start with Ailey, what would be your top tip? I think I'd just go back to not, not re um, restricting whole food groups uh, unless you can actually replace those nutrients from elsewhere and it's actually proven to, to be beneficial for you. Okay, brilliant. And Sam, what would be your top tip? Well, I'd say try to eat as varied a diet as you can using fresh ingredients as much as possible so that you avoid processed foods and don't have an excess or deficiency in any foods or nutrients. Fantastic. Emma? I think exercise is underrated because that's great for gut function, particularly if you're having a day where things are a little bit sluggish. But quite often it's enough, enough to get out in the sunshine sometimes, get some vitamin D, get a few steps, and that can really help. And you had also another a project that you wanted to mention as well. So there's a national study going on called PREDICT, which is actually aiming to predict what causes inflammatory bowel disease flare-ups. So this is something that patients can sign up for via a website. and what they can do is to then take part by filling in questionnaires. So it won't affect your treatment, but it's very useful in terms of predicting things such as certain changes in diet and various other things, which might contribute to flares. So we can put a lot of patient data together anonymously, and then actually work out what those triggers are. So we may be further forward in five to 10 years by people taking part in these sorts of studies. That would be a fantastic study for people to take part in. Do we know the website address? So the web address is www predict which is spelt p r e d i double c t dot co dot uk fantastic and uh, to finish off charlie what would be your top tip as a gp so my top tip would be to as an ibd patient have a look at the crohn's and colitis uk website um, you'll see that on this webinar one of the handouts is the ibd uh, and diet hand handbook and they have loads and loads of other advice on their website fact sheets, booklets about different aspects of IBD, lots of support there. So I'd have a good look at that website. Um, a fantastic charity, Crohn's and Colitis UK. That is brilliant. And just to finish off, don't forget that you can download the handouts, um, other NHS webinars and through our website, which is patientwebinars.co.uk. So I'd like to just say a huge thank you to our panelists tonight. Um, and uh, thank you very much to Sam Paul, Aileen Fraser, Emma Gregg and Charlie Andrews and thank you very much for joining us this evening. Goodbye.